Desperate Cat was a hard Java web hacking capture the flag challenge from the real world CTF. In the end, only two teams solved it, Wreck the Line and Sauercloud. And Sauercloud was the team I was playing with. So let me tell you the story how we solved it. Desperate Cat, web difficulty hard. We get an IP address to connect to as well as an attachment with the required files for a local setup. When you connect to it with netcat, it will tell you to solve a proof of work first. Enter a string whose md5 hash starts with those random 5 hex characters. So this is basically intended as a captcha. Each team has to have their own isolated instance and to handle the scheduling and prevent denial of service attacks, they ask you to solve a computationally expensive task as a proof of work like Bitcoin mining or a captcha. But what I didn't realize immediately, one in our team noticed it, this method for proof of work is inherently flawed. There are essentially only hex FFFFF possible combinations. So there are only a little bit over 1 million possible hashes. And we can write a simple Python script to brute force all of them. Just throw random input at it and remember the inputs based on the first 5 hex characters. This runs for like 2 minutes and in the end you have a huge dictionary with pre-calculated solutions. So when we connect and it challenges us with the five hex characters, we simply query the dict and we get our pre-calculated input that will generate the MD5 hash that starts with these five hex characters. This is a bit like how rainbow tables work if you ever wondered. Anyway, with this port, we now have access to our unique instance. And if we had the solution, we could hack the site and get the flag. But we don't have that yet. And the instance only lives for 180 seconds anyway. So let's get a local setup going. I love CTF challenges where you get the whole setup. There's no black box guessing involved to solve it. All you need is here. So in the desperate cat archive, you can find a Docker file, a specific JDK and the Apache Tomcat version. Root.war file, JDK, Tomcat. We immediately know we have a Java web hacking challenge here. Besides that, we have a test flag and a C program that simply reads this flag. The permissions will be set up so that you have to execute that program to read the flag. This is done so you must get remote code execution and not just reading a local file. Anyway, the Docker file will help us to get a local test setup going. So we first build the Docker image with Docker build and I give it the name dcat. With Docker run, we can run the image in a container. I run it detached, give it the name dcat as well, expose the web port to port 8888 on my local machine and select the image dcat. Now we see that the container is running and we can access localhost on port 8888 to interact with the challenge. Cool. So where do we start? This website looks pretty empty. But we don't have to brute force or guess. We can simply look at the page sources. The root.war file is an archive that you can extract and it contains the important server files. A good start is the web.xml file which tells you how the website is configured. And in there we can see we have an export URL route that is mapped to a servlet named export servlet. In the web in folder we can find the servlet class export servlet and two utils classes. So this class is executed when somebody tries to access a export URL. Dot class files are compiled Java code, so not clear code, but we can use something like jdgui to easily decompile this class and have a look at the code. And in there we see a handler for a post request and it requires three parameters, dir, file name and content. So let's start interacting with this website using these parameters. We could also read the code to figure out what happens, but let's just dynamically test at this point. To do that, we could write some code to send request or use a tool like burp. By the way, don't forget the content type for the URL encoded post variables. Okay, you will quickly notice that you can upload a file with this content to this directory in the web root. It even tells you the full path where the file is uploaded to. And you might notice that you can control the file extension as well. In this case, we uploaded a JSP file with the content just being XX. This file should be now in the web root. So when we go to the URL starting from the web root, we can access this file, but there's also some garbage text before and after the XX content. The source for that is clear when you look into the code. This is prepended and appended to the content. And yes, that is there to make the challenge more annoying. 
Now, we just uploaded a JSP file, so you might think we can just try out a basic JSP web shell and get remote code execution. Easy. But see what happens when we upload that. When we browse to that file, we see just text. The evil characters were HTML encoded. And looking at the sources again, we can see that these evil characters are replaced. We cannot use pointy brackets, and even if we could, we cannot use parentheses for function calls or even quotes for strings. Does that mean JSP injection is not possible at all? Well, besides the typical JSP tags with direct code execution, there also exists the JSP expression language. And that uses curly braces. It's less known, I guess, because usually you just do the basic JSP shell. But even if you didn't know about the expression language, you might even just stumble over this when you are trying out typical template injection strings or fuzz inputs. In this case, this multiplication 5 times 5 works and the output is 25. And when you provoke an error, the stack trace also tells you about the EL expression language feature. All right, up until this point, I haven't even started working on the challenge. I didn't figure out any of that. With very hard CTFs, it's typical. You do not solve the challenges alone. And for this challenge, we were multiple people hanging out on Discord to brainstorm. And so when I joined for this challenge, others already documented all of this. When I joined, I was told we can inject the JSP expression language and somehow we need to get remote code execution to execute read flag. And this is the actual start of the challenge anyway. So after I couldn't find basic expression language shells without the forbidden characters, I started playing around and reading documentation about the expression language. For example, this article explains that there are implicit objects, for example, application scope, param or page context. Also, when you have a get param, it will show up here and you can access it. So to easier work with this challenge, somebody started writing a testing script and then I took that and modified it to my liking. It's not that important, it's a bit hacky. It simply sends the two required requests. First, it uploads the file with some content and then accesses the JSP file to execute the EL expression and print the output. I also set the proxy so I can see all the requests in burp for debugging. Let's do an example with param. It uploads a JSP file with this EL expression and here's the output, an empty dictionary. Let's try page context. This is a lot more interesting. If you have programmed Java before, this add number indicates that we try to print an object of the class Apache Jasper runtime page context implementation. Hmm. If we look at the application scope, we get a lot of information. Cleaning that up and listing the key value pairs, we can easily see, for example, there is a servlet context temptier configured or some Catalin JSP class path sounds interesting. But we also have more objects like the Apache Tomcat instance manager. I've written my small script in a way so that I can easily explore this further. So these are all keys on the application scope. And by executing my script like this, application scope followed by another argument, it automatically constructs an EL expression with application scope accessing the dict using the key param A. So it tries to access a value based on the parameter A and it adds a get parameter to the URL with this value. Because we cannot use quotes to add strings into the expression itself due to the filter, this is a trick to get strings we want into there. So param A will be the Java X surflet context temp tier, and we can now print that value. With that, testing became a lot easier. But what do we do with this now? How can we find anything useful? We decided to look at Tomcat by going to the GitHub repository. And instead of cloning it, I just press the dot on the keyboard to open up an editor in the browser. And a good starting point might be to look for one of the classes. Here's one. And that's something I started doing. I was exploring what kind of objects can I reach from within this expression language. But we still didn't have any idea how to exploit this. The biggest problem was that we couldn't execute functions because parentheses were not allowed. However, one of us noticed that you can perform assignments. So for example, the JSP class path, when I write equal to param.a, my script creates this expression language. We try to assign 1337 to the class path. And when we query it again, we actually permanently overwrote it. So we figured out that the expression language generally allows us to access getters and setters of any object. That's pretty powerful, but still far away from remote code execution. But we didn't seem to have any other choices. All we can do is walk objects, access their properties via getters, and sometimes assign values if they have setters. 
but it still does not allow us to execute typical JSP shell. And as far as we could tell, there is no publicly available example of a JSP shell without these forbidden characters. Well, we had a lot of ideas, some more dumb than others. For example, we were wondering if we could modify the characters in the parameters class because when their length is different, the string would not be sanitized. If we could somehow overwrite them, we could maybe upload a proper JSP shell. But the problem was we couldn't find a reference to this object and it was private static final anyway. Which led me to exploring the possibilities for Java reflections. I knew we could access class and get the declared fields, but I couldn't figure out a way to change stuff without executing other functions. A completely other idea I was exploring was maybe the string utils replace function. Maybe the challenge had nothing to do with EL expressions and there was a bug in the custom replace code. So I used the Java fuzzer Jazzer, which I learned about from the new log4j video I made recently. Here I fuzzed the replace function. Maybe we can figure out how to get parentheses into a file. Yeah, you can imagine all of these tests take a lot of time to develop and still no luck, no finding. So I guess back to looking for objects and values to overwrite. I'm not exaggerating. I have sat there for hours and hours just looking at the kind of objects I can access and then looking at the Tomcat source code of that class to see what other objects I can access or if there are interesting properties to overwrite. It's really laborious. But then I had a little breakthrough. On Discord I wrote this. Is this useful? Fail to load or instantiate string interpreter class hacks. That sounded interesting. I found this when I looked at this string interpreter object on the application scope and I overwrote it. Here I used a get parameter pwn to set it to a string and when I did that and tried to send another request the server crashed. I got the following backtrace and it says fail to load or instantiate string interpreter class pwn. Huh? Did I just try to load a class? Having a look into the source code we can see what happened. This string interpreter factory checks the string interpreter class name on the context. If it's of the type string interpreter it assumes it already created one and returns that object. But if it's of type string it thinks it still has to load it. So it calls create instance which gets a configured class loader from the context and then executes load class. That is crazy. We can load classes. And spoilers. This is going to be the core technique of our exploit and I found this at 2 a.m. in the night. But let me put this into perspective. 24 hours later, 2 a.m. the next day, we still haven't solved the challenge. But we had our plan for exploitation. We were just struggling with some details. It took until 8 a.m. in the morning when P.S. Paul finally solved it. But I'm getting ahead of myself. I just want to highlight how much time this challenge took us. As I said, this is the core primitive for our exploit and it still took us dozens of hours after that until we solved it. So the problem with this class loading is that we didn't know what class to instantiate. And right afterwards it would try to cast it to a string interpreter object and crash anyway. We cannot interact with that class, so we cannot get arbitrary objects to play around. So I wasn't too excited at the time, but as I said, that was an important puzzle piece for our exploit. Through another object path I found the class loader instance used here. Application scope Apache Catalina resources, then context, loader and class loader. This way we get access to the path where the class loader is looking for classes. And there is only one path, a file path to the web inf classes folder. And I was thinking, if we could overwrite this path, for example an HTTP URL, we could maybe get remote class loading. The problem was the path is not a string object. When I tried to assign the string pwn I got the following error. Cannot convert pwn of type string to class java net url. So we need a url object instead. I was still hopeful though maybe we can just modify the protocol of the existing class loader url. Unfortunately the url class has getters to get the protocol but I cannot set it. Property protocol not writable on type java net url. But maybe there is some other class and object that returns a URL object. For example, maybe there are headers that can have a host URL header or a referrer header, but turns out they are all just strings. So I spent hours scouring through the sources for objects that have methods and properties with URLs, because then I could take those and overwrite the class path entry with them. But eventually I was really losing hope for that. 
Now, maybe you're thinking, just upload a class file and put it in the class folder and then load the class. But the problem is, dot class files have to start with the famous Java magic value, hex cafe babe. And our file upload puts garbage at the start of the file. So we cannot upload a class file. However, I was wondering, could we upload a jar file instead? I was looking up how I can load a class from a jar file in Tomcat and I learned about the webinf lib folder. So could we get the jar file uploaded into there? You might think we will have the same problem like with .class files, but I know that jar files are basically just zip files. And the zip file format is awesome for file format trickery. Zip files don't have to start with a magic. I was sure that we could create a valid jar file that has the garbage at the start and end and still work. So I tested the general theory. I created a small proof of concept pwn class with the static code. This code simply executes the system command to call read flag and write the output to a text file into the web root. If this works, we should then get the flag. So I compiled it with the Java version from the challenge container and put it inside a jar file. Pwn.jar. As a first test, I copied the jar into the Docker container with Docker CP, pwn jar, the container name, colon, and the path. But I noticed the lib folder doesn't exist, so I had to create one. Then copied the file and tried loading this pwn class, but it didn't work. Hmm. I was playing around with it more, modified my code, also tried to prepend the garbage stuff, and with a later test, it worked. I got another error and I noticed the code was executed. We got the flag into the web root and read it from the browser. I was confused. When looking at the class loader URLs, I saw indeed the jars are now in the path, including the jar where I added the garbage. It was able to load it. What I didn't immediately realize was that I made a mistake. You see, I used Docker restart to restart the container and this didn't remove the jars I copied into the libs folder. It turned out that the jars are only added to the class loader pass when the server restarts. So my malicious jar was only loaded because I restarted the server. Which means on a fresh new challenge server, my uploaded jar would not be loaded. Damn. Of course, immediately we were brainstorming how to reload the server. Somebody was wondering if we could crash DOS it to force a reload. But then one of us figured out that writing to the webxml config file would trigger a reload of the server. Problem was, if we would be able to write to it with our file upload, it probably wouldn't be valid xml. Why that? Well, if we would have the capability to write a valid xml file, we probably could then also just write an actual JSP shell. So yeah, this avenue for reload didn't work. But when I was playing around with this, I stumbled over a trick. I was looking for different config files or folders that we could write to that would not crash the server but trigger a reload. And I found this Tomcat web XML file. But look at this, in my sleepless brain I thought I was creating this file, but later I realized I was just creating a folder with that name. But that was a happy accident, because the creation of this folder triggered the reload of the server and didn't cause the server to break. So now we have a way to reload the server and load jars into the class loader path and then load a malicious class from it with our string interpreter primitive. The solution seemed simple now. One issue though, remember we have these forbidden characters that would get replaced? Remember the jar files are basically zip files with binary data so if the jar contains one of the disallowed characters it would overwrite them and corrupt the jar which means we have to create a jar that does not contain these bytes. And to make matters worse, it turned out that the upload encoding is effed up too. Here on the left is the original jar and on the right is the jar how it arrives when you upload it. You see the added garbage text? That is not bad, but see these bytes? These non-ASCII values are replaced with the infamous replace character. The jar is completely corrupted. Damn, we cannot use any non-ASCII values. So what's the solution? We had to create a malicious jar that is completely valid ASCII. So we could only use bytes under hex 7f and also do not contain the characters that are not allowed. And yes, that works. But to be honest, I was not really involved in that part. Others in the team solved this. All I can tell you is that they based their work on ASCII zip, which is a tool that can compress data so the result is valid ASCII. 
but you still need some work by hand to take the output of this tool to craft a final valid jar file with the class and manifest. So it's not simple plug and play in this case. But here's the final jar they shared. It contained a pwn.class. Now let's do the whole thing. Let's get a new instance using our MD5 proof of work trick and then we can adjust the URLs in my script. I use this upload Python script which will upload the jar and trigger the reload. Executing that, then we can look if the server reloaded and if the jar is now part of the class path. Let's see, there it is. Now we can trigger the string interpreter primitive. This should look for the pwn class inside the jar and execute the static code on load. No apparent errors, this looks good. Let's check if we have the file. And there it is, we have the flag. What a crazy challenge. As you can tell by the time I spent on this, it was actually fun to look for useful objects and properties to overwrite. I knew there must be a way to get remote code execution, so that was a real motivating puzzle challenge. But it's not unrealistic. I think through this challenge we managed to show what is possible, even if the uploaded file is heavily sanitized and we proved that it's possible to craft a malicious jar as valid ASCII. Hopefully knowing this, it can be helpful to somebody in the future when you can do a JSP file upload, but your character set is limited. By the way, also take a look at the intended solution. They found a very different strategy to the one we found. And I love that, totally different strategy. They managed to write an arbitrary JSP file with a full JSP shell. It's so creative. Anyway, really fun challenge. Felt really good to solve it in the end. And don't forget, it was a big team effort. It's normal to not solve something like this alone.